Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which as almost other, almost all other little think tanks are, is in virtual mode. We are, however, trying to look at the same sorts of things as we were looking in the real world. And one of them is obviously for financial sustainability. Uh, and this particular panel discussion is going to look at how the sustainability debate is, a, is being affected by the COVID-19 panic crisis, call it what you will. Uh, I'm delighted that we have an enormously distinguished panel uh, led by Chris Hune. You, I mean, if you're in the UK, everyone knows Chris Hune. He was the, uh, he was the cabinet minister responsible for energy and climate change. He, after having left politics, he's made a, a, another career for himself in the alternative uh, finance and uh, sustainability areas. Um, but he's not alone in this panel. Uh, we also have Stan Dupre, who is the founding, well, the, the chief executive of the Two Degree Investing Institute, uh, the founder and CEO of it. It is a global think tank. It has offices in Paris, New York, Boston, and London. Uh, he, I think, is calling from uh, coming into this discussion from New York. It has, uh, it has an immensely ambitious agenda. Uh, we carry out, it says, his website says, we carry out the world's largest research programs in climate goals. It is, he's also the convener of the ISO 14097 Working Group on Climate and Finance and a former member of the European Commission's High Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. It's, um, it's an awesome CV. Uh, from Geneva, we have Pulang Unjuwili Potele, uh, a South African who is working with UNEP, uh, where she is the, co the project leader, the coordinator of the banking project, which uh, comes under UNEP's finance initiative. So that's a sort of powerful panel. Uh, I want to give each of our speakers no more than three or four minutes just to talk a, a little bit about how they see the evolution of the environmental debate in this plague year. I give you Chris Hume. Chris. Thanks, thanks very much, Andrew. I'll try and be as quick as possible. Uh, what does it really mean for the recovery longer term? Every big crisis is always accompanied by the refrain that it must never happen again and things must change. And in fact, continuity always uh, seems to be the uh, key. However, COVID-19 helps frame the debate in a way that's rather helpful for tackling climate change, because it is, after all, a debate about humankind versus its threats. Uh, and that's exactly what we need if we're going to tackle climate change as well. I hope, too, that it's ended the anti-growth debate on climate change, because even with a massive global recession, Emissions are down on the latest estimates about 9% in the first uh, quarter of the year, and that's nothing like enough. We can only grow our way out of the climate crisis with new low-carbon activities. In this context, COVID-19 has accelerated a number of the key trends that were already underway and which are broadly helpful to tackling the climate crisis, so e-commerce, rather than high street, main street retail, home working versus office working, renewable share of electricity generation rising as electricity demand is down uh, sharply, digital meetings, not large gatherings, uptake of 3D printing and localization of supply chains, remote personal services like, for example, medical diagnoses, uh, collapse of business travel and the rise, as we see today, of Zoom and Skype. Now, some structural changes that we can expect are clearly going to depend on how quickly we find a vaccine, if we find a vaccine, and how quickly we end social distancing. So the disproportionate effect on the hospitality industry, on tourism, on public transport, aviation, aerospace, uh, will depend on short-term uh, medical developments. If it's slow, the economy could stay depressed for a long time, and it will be very lopsided, uh, with some businesses benefiting, maybe electrical vehicles, cars, e-commerce, internet-based businesses, and others at historic levels of depression. And this is very unusual for a global uh, recession. Structural decline will have hit some of the service businesses uh, with the richest past jobs growth and the highest income elasticity of demand, tourism, hospitality, personal services. 
This may also mean uh, that people eventually spend on what they can and prices begin to take off uh, on those things that people want that they can still want. Uh, maybe cars, if they're still afraid of public transport, home goods, and so on. The pattern of recovery will also depend on the trajectory of the oil price. Uh, back off the negative lows, now at 33 bucks a barrel. But how much damage did those lows actually do to the oil sector? Could uh, there be such a supply shock to the relatively expensive, low volume, high cost uh, production uh, that will now be shut in? So think of all of those US nodding donkeys, often producing relatively small amounts of oil with a lot of water that needs to be taken out, relatively high running costs. If a lot of that was just shut in because it couldn't pay its way, then the oil price rise could be explosive once inventories are worked down. And that will, of course, reinforce the underlying shift to renewables that we're already seeing because of the falling price of, uh, of renewables. Uh, now, people are going to go back to their offices. We are social animals and the water cooler matters, but less so. CFOs are going to use this as an excuse to cut off the space uh, and to rotate home working. There's going to be a shift in demand for commercial property. That's bad news for developers and for their banks. National policymakers will find job-intensive growth very attractive. We're going to be on the lookout for FDR-style new deals. Uh, and we can use intensive work and depression hotspots with things like, for example, insulation programs to save energy. A Green New Deal on renewables infrastructure and energy insulation could include big budget geoengineering solutions to buy time and to rescue aerospace, satellites, sunscreens, cloud seeding, uh, pelleting oceans to increase CO2 absorption, etc. And those who adopt climate change policy early, uh, which I envisage to be the EU and China, will also talk about protecting their industries from those that do not by using carbon levies. This has already started very clearly in Europe. The carbon levy debate is now well and truly uh, out of the box. And one of the biggest skeptics, the UK, is no longer at the council table. Uh, so expect EU carbon levies against non-Paris players, including a Trump-led US if he wins again. Final point, Global policymakers still face a big conundrum. Just as COVID-19 emphasizes that we're all in the same boat, uh, the structures of global decision-making are weak and are creaking. Uh, the WHO under fire from Trump is one example. UNFCC uh, is another, the UN itself. If there is a US change in November, there may be new global leadership. It's hard, uh, but it's possible. If Trump is re-elected, I think that we're going to see nationalists using uh, the blame game as a way of deflecting attention. And global decision making becomes uh, more difficult, but you see a coalition of the willing, which will be the leaders uh, in terms of Europe and probably China, uh, tackling the climate issue. Okay. I thought when you were talking about nodding donkeys that you were actually discussing Washington at the time. One small amendment, I see that Nature Climate Change published today figures showing that daily global emissions were down 17%, not 9% in early April. But at the same time, I also read in the FT that China's pollution has rebounded to pre-crisis levels already. Uh, Stan, Stan Dupre, how do you respond to that? And are you as optimistic, I guess, as, as Chris is? Um, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't exactly know uh, what would be the, the outcome in the economy. Well, I think I share... Of course you have a crystal ball. <laughs> I, I share, I think, uh, broadly the, the, uh, the conclusion. Um, from our angle, I'm, I'm, I would say the, the, um, we're interested to see how it will change uh, the supervision of the finance sector, for instance, because um, so as you mentioned in your introduction, we're, we're a think tank specialized on, uh, on, on climate mostly. And so prior to the crisis, we were um, notably helping uh, central banks, so the Bank of England and other, to design their stress test on climate related risk. Um, and so obviously now it's uh, all the team uh, are focused on COVID-19, so we're developing COVID-19 uh, stress tests. 
Um, but what is interesting here is that when, when we first uh, started to work with the, the central banks and the supervisors on those climate stress tests, our, our um, message was basically, well, it looks like you're doing that because you have a, a political pressure to actually act on climate. Um, whether it is a financial stability risk is another question. And probably uh, the role of the supervisor is not, is not necessarily to, to develop stress tests to test the shock because um, climate change is not a type of risk that is likely to stop the economy overnight like the pandemics did. Um, but it's a long-term risk, like a kind of slow-burning risk that might have a bigger implication, but that will materialize, uh, materialize too slow to be captured by very short-term focused uh, risk management metrics and system within the, the financial industry. And so we were actually advocating for two things. One is uh, this type of long-term supervision. And the second one is like, if you're really interested to test uh, shocks on things that are non-conventional, non -conventional, probably a pandemic would be a good idea. So you can probably download a couple of reports from us prior to the, the crisis, calling for a pandemic stress test. Um, <laughs> Not calling so for a pandemic, just the stress a test. A bit too late for that, I guess. Um, I mean, even though there would probably be uh, other, <laughs> other pandemics uh, in the next uh, few uh, years and decades. But uh, the bottom line here is I think the, um, there will probably be um, the acknowledgement that uh, the, sup the financial supervisory system and more broadly, I would say, the, uh, the way financial risks are captured across the chain are not necessarily completely suitable to the type of risk we are facing, uh, as exemplified by the past financial crisis, this crisis, and so on. So I, I think that would be one takeaway uh, from, from this in terms of uh, culture of the finance, uh, the financial supervision. Um, I think another trend that I would see is that um, you like it's. I was very surprised to see the responses of governments and basically how they prioritize saving lives over uh, economic consideration and GDP. Um, I was like, I mean, I think it's a good thing, but uh, I was like. Actually, I did not expect that. If I were to design a scenario, I would be like, wow, that's a, that's a strong reaction. And so one, one paper we are writing right now uh, is to try to compare. So when you, uh, you start to get into the, the math of death, uh, you have different metrics actually that are used to do that. So right now on, the, uh, on prime time uh, cable news, we see a uh, number of deaths. But uh, when it comes to measuring the impact of um, disease, what is usually do is uh, he use these uh, dailies, which is the disabled adjusted life uh, years, where so the number of years you lose um, that are where you don't have a disability, basically, and um, you that's used to compare different uh, plagues, basically. And here, what one thing that is interesting to focus on is basically. How much? How many um, uh, points of GDP did we lose per million of the, those dailies uh, saved? Mm -hmm. And to compare that with all the lives that are sacrificed on a daily basis uh, due to decision on uh, standard regarding air pollution, uh, like the lack of action to mitigate climate, and I think this will come into the debate. The fact that uh, right now with this crisis, saving lives has been prioritized and like the lives that are lost due to air pollution, due to climate change and, and sacrificed on a daily basis by political decisions that are um, not favoring those, uh, those aspects. There is a, a complete disconnect basically. And um, I would say lives that are advertised on a daily basis in, in cable news are prioritized, and those of the younger generation are entirely discounted, basically. And so I think this math, I mean, I don't know if it will be sh like framed this way, but this, the acknowledgement that um, there's basically different rules applied to different categories of people uh, when it comes to public decision on that, I think it will, it will emerge in the public debate 
and probably change the nature of the debate on, on environmental regulation. Uh, when, does this, when does this work come out? Because this is really important stuff. I can point you in the direction of many blogs that would love to have that raw material at hand. We're working on it, working on it. Like we have a kind of a lot to do these days, but yeah, we will. Uh, I will get back to you uh, when we will have this ready. Okay, well, Puleng, tell us what uh, UNEP's doing in this area, and particularly the UNEP Financial um, Initiative, Financial Industry Initiative. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> so, very interesting um, listening to the other two uh, panelists. And I think to just add on to what Stan has said, I do think what this crisis has done is it's brought or brought light on um, the structural inequalities, challenges um, that have been there for quite a long time, but I think has really uh, uh, brought them out. So in terms of uh, what we are doing at Unify, um, as you said, um, I'm part of the banking team, and uh, in September of last year, we launched the Principles for Responsible Banking, um, which to date have 176 signatories. And these signatories um, have come together um, and shared responses uh, for how it is that they have gone about responding to um, the COVID crisis. So we ran a series on that where banks could share with each other from different corners of the world, um, how they were working with their governments, how they were responding uh, to challenges being faced by um, their clients and customers in this regard, um, rolling out various um, responses um, to, to, to basically deliver some, some relief. And I think what I want to say about that is what we've seen out of that is just how important it is um, to have partnerships uh, as we think about um, you know, building back better, um, inclusive, building inclusive um, and green economies. So I think that's something that is uh, very much top of mind um, for our members. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Sorry. I carry on? Okay. Mm, yeah, please. So other work that we're currently doing is um, we've rolled out across our um, signatories, uh, working groups where banks are working together um, in various areas. I think very important to this is looking at how um, the impact uh, of, um, you know, the, the, the rollout of their capital um, has an impact. And I think that, you know, those kinds of learnings coming through um, will also help to drive um, green growth. And importantly, we have one working group um, that is uh, basically supporting the collective commitment to climate action, where we've got 37 banks um, that represent 14 trillion uh, in assets. And uh, they have made a commitment um, to align uh, their portfolios to reflect and finance uh, the low carbon and climate resilient economies uh, that are required um, to limit global warming to well below two degrees, uh, striving for one. Let, let me come in and ask you something very specific. And I, I really want both uh, um, Stan and, and Chris also to respond to it. In the, in the face of this crisis, there is a lot of pressure to roll back financial regulation. I mean, it's already happening in the US to some extent. It's, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, regulatory forbearance going on in the UK and in Europe. Are you seeing that amongst the people, the, the 170 institutions in your network? Kuleng first. All right, thanks. I think what we are seeing is uh, banks actually wanting um, to build momentum. I think there's an understanding that we are at a crucial moment right now and that there are opportunities uh, for us to make decisions that will have long lasting um, impact. And so I think that um, a lot of our signatories um, have been committed to uh, this very ambitious uh, framework of uh, aligning their business strategies uh, with what society needs um, as uh, it is set out in the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate, actually recognize that there's an opportunity here for us to um, basically try to respond, in, to respond to this crisis in a way um, that does actually help to create more um, inclusive uh, societies um, founded on greener technologies um, and greener energy. So I think that's the sentiment that we're getting. Um, but of course, you know, it's not an easy, simple journey. Um, but I think that the, the willingness and the understanding that now is the time to act and that we shouldn't actually be rolling back, I think that's understood. 
If I was a senior banker, I'd think this is the moment when I'm going to roll back all the regulations that I never wanted in the first place, and I'm going to blame it all on COVID. Chris, is, how do you see it? Well, I think that I think that that's a, a, an instinct that I, I certainly recognise. Um, I suspect uh, that there will be, uh, nevertheless, in for a lot of bankers, they will be looking at a rather different attitude towards the existing assets and capital uh, against how they intend to go forward. Um, there may be some real recidivists in there, but in general. Uh, you know, bankers will have quite a lot of regret about what's on the current balance sheet. Um, and that distinction between the new behavior going forward and what's already there is, I suspect, one that they will try and push with regulators. Stan? Yeah, well, I, th I think we can definitely expect some, uh, some uh, rollback uh, of, uh, of regulation. I mean, due to the, this phenomenon that you, you mentioned that is indeed pretty common. Um, what, I, what I see as well is the, I mean, right now, I think also what we see is that the, the, uh, there will also be an acknowledgement with the crisis of the, the, the key role of governments in just maintaining some stability in the economy. Uh, I think it was very interesting, for instance, in the in the U.S. to see that uh, the amount of the bailout for airlines is more or less the same amount as the um, like uh, share uh, repurchased that have been done over the past few years. So there is like some that's something that will necessarily end up in the in the public debate. And so this idea that basically the the uh, the big the big players, the, the blue chips, uh, s still need to be bailed out every 10 years by governments. I think this is something where it seems it, it, it's kind of, uh, it was perceived as an anomaly uh, in the 2008 crisis. I think now it will be perceived as the, like the business as usual and probably also change the perspective on the role of uh, uh, monetary authority authorities and, and public authorities in general. Uh, which might, in this case, create a kind of, uh, I mean, re somehow reinforce the mandate to, to, uh, to regulate. Um, this said, I think the, the, uh, the crisis also uh, uh, showed that basically, in many cases, governments have been uh, um, managing risk with slogans uh, rather than like uh, actual actions and so that will create a, a lack of trust i think in in uh, in government and supervision uh that will have probably very long lasting effects um isn't there a problem i mean you're equating the coronavirus with the great financial crisis the great financial crisis i mean no very few people would deny was the fault of the financial institutions themselves and in connivance with the regulators but this is genuinely an exogenous shock that's come in and just blown everybody away. Isn't there, isn't there a perfectly plausible case for giving financial institutions more relief because this wasn't their fault than it was uh, 10 years ago when it clearly was their fault, Chris? Uh, well, you might you might think that, except that um, uh, you know th this is one of those risks which everybody has had on their radar for years and years. I mean, governments, financial institutions, rating agencies, you name it. Uh, you know, it's it's it, it's top of the UK national risk register was a uh, a major pandemic of this type, and yet governments and financial institutions and the Bank of England uh, ignored the obvious steps. But you would have thought that if it was actually number one on the national risk register, they would be actually looking at that. And far from uh, uh, actually helping the government, for example, went backwards, made it so that a lot of the protective equipment for health workers um, in the UK was out of date and was not kept in date uh, because of budget cuts. So uh, there is an argument there, um, certainly that this is an exogenous shock, but boy, it was one that we should have seen coming in exactly the same way, by the way, as we should see climate change coming. Uh, and one of the reasons for drawing, I think, a, a parallel between the two is that perhaps, I hope, uh, that decision makers are going to be rather more aware of the importance of dealing with 
risks which are really important risks and, and, and potentially devastating risks if you don't uh, deal with them in a timely manner. So your, your response would be that they don't deserve to catch a break. This, you know, the, 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 reality, the reality is they're going to, you know, we're not going to see banks that are too big to fail fail. So, you know, we need the payment system. Uh, and I think politically it's going to be an easier sell if that happens than it was last time. Uh, I think it would have been an easier sell last time if there had been much more push through on holding key decision makers to account, which didn't happen. Um, but uh, I, I think it will be an easier sell this time. And climate change targets in general, Puleng, you, you, you see that these are still relevant in the current environment and you still see a push towards make, attaining them and indeed perhaps exceeding them, Puleng. I think we, it's something we have to do. Um, I think what is necessary right now is to um, refrain from rolling back and to definitely move forward and to not lose the agenda um, of driving, you know, responses to climate change and to biodiversity loss, I think, which is something that's uh, really pertinent as well um, in, in this discussion. So I said uh, earlier on that, you know, we have work that is going on internally uh, with some of our banks who have committed uh, to respond very decisively to, um, you know, the, to, to uh, the climate challenge. Um, and they're pushing ahead. They're doing their work. Uh, they have a time frame of three years to set their targets. And so I think uh, the commitment, at least uh, from my perspective and our members, um, is still there. And I think it's something that really needs to still remain top of agenda and we need to to, to continue to, to push for that. I absolutely, I assume that, Stan, that is absolutely your position as well. I mean, one thing that I did notice before the coronavirus was that there seemed to be uh, not a shift, I guess, an add-on that we were moving from climate change to an ex almost overwhelming concern with climate change issues to biodiversity issues. Uh, and that, that was a kind of e a natural evolution of the debate. Has the debate stopped or, you know, in, in your opinion, are we still pr moving into a, a broader definition of environmental issues than we had before? Yeah, I think so. I think the, the so there's the, um, my, my understanding, j just uh, maybe uh, following up a little bit on the on the thoughts of Chris on this uh, question of uh, whether uh, this coronavirus crisis is an ex-generous risk or uh, like man-made uh, disaster. And I I'm completely uh, agree with him that if you look at, this was on the top of the uh, global risk in every scenario analysis which you can do. And still, uh, most governments, they did not put the measure in place. Uh, the central banks, they didn't conduct any stress test on that. Oh. Uh, airlines were not ready for that. They had no plan. And so I think this will be like front and center in the debate after that. Is like the level of preparedness for this type of thing uh, is completely in, like inappropriate, basically. And in this case, it, cost, it will cost uh, millions of jobs. Uh, hundreds of thousands of lives, and this is like human decision that were not uh, well uh, designed uh, prior to the crisis. And so I think this acknowledgement will probably be exported for the debate in other systems, in other sectors, and, and on financial regulation. So I don't think, I agree with you, I don't think the banks are specifically uh, frontline here in terms of criticism. Um, but I think this, this uh, uh, observation that uh, this type of global risk are completely mismanaged will be uh, applicable to the, to the finance sector and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and thinking about financial, reg of, of financial regulators. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, regarding your second question on whether we're um, extending the focus from climate to a broader set of risks, I think moving forward, um, I would expect that right now we see climate change as a kind of uh, specific risk that requires specific uh, to be specifically addressed. I think post-crisis we will probably have a broader definition and just map the, the different type of macro trends or, and risk, pandemics, uh, AI, automation, like you name it, 
that can that can be very disruptive, whether uh, materialized as a shock or a slow burning risk, and how we we get ready for that, which is and the, the answer today is like absolutely not. So um, yeah, I would expect also probably closer um, I would say coordination between um, supervisors and monetary authorities on the one hand and public authorities on the other hand in the way they handle that. Because here what we see, for instance, is like who, how do we prioritize the economy versus like other consideration? There's no blueprint for that. Like, I mean, governments are like making inconsistent decisions that change priorities one day to another. I mean, here in the U.S., it's like just, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost, uh, it's, I mean, if it was not that bad, it would be entertaining. Um, and, the, uh, and yeah, basically there's no blueprint. So I think this is what we will see emerging at the, uh, after this crisis. And my understanding is environmental risk and factors will be a subset of this broader debate, probably. Do you want to come in on that, Chris? Well, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there are two big issues that come out of this and which, which, which affect the, the climate change. One is, how do human institutions, political, financial, economic, handle the long term versus the short term? And, you know, we've just been bad at that. I think democracies are bad at that. People, people who take political decisions in, in democracies, i.e. Uh, ministers and governments, tend to... Capitalism is also bad. I'm sorry? Capitalism is also bad at it, isn't it? Well, uh, in some things and not necessarily in others. I mean, you can get uh, extraordinary investment in long-term R&D, um, you know, uh, which surprises me. Um, so there, is, there, there are groups of people who are prepared to take those long things. But I think, you know, in general, there is a whole set of issues around long-term versus short-term. And the other thing is about global versus national, because these are global threats, climate change, uh, the pandemic. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're no respecters of station uh, or of uh, ge geography, uh, and we need a, a global response. Uh, as long as this pandemic exists anywhere uh, in substantial amounts on this planet, it's going to be a threat. So, um, and that will recur with other, with other similar... But, but surely the, the lesson that people are going to take away from this particular pandemic is that international initiatives are too slow, that what you really need to do is close your borders, close your borders, take national decisions immediately. Isn't that a, a, a takeaway which is entirely contradictory to, to the, the desire for an international response. Aren't we pushing the, the global economy into a, a world of protectionism and nationalism rather than internationalism? Well, I think, I think you're right about some of the economic implications, but I think that the need to have an international warning system and international best practice guidelines, which may indeed include rapid shutting of borders and isolation of outbreaks and so forth, as we saw in China, even internally, uh, all of that is going to be absolutely crucial, including vaccines. And, you know, the idea that somehow, however good your border controls are, you can seriously protect yourself uh, if there's a global outbreak of, 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 of something as fatal as COVID-19 strikes me as being uh, for cloud cuckoo land. So, uh, you know, this is, you're, you're right that the reaction may well be isolation, national borders, but actually you need an international framework for analyzing, preparing for it, and hopefully uh, working very quickly on things like vaccines. Stan. Yes, well, I I completely agree. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm really fascinated to see the uh, the decision to close border for uh, like health reason right now, and like the absence of plan to to like deal with that on the on the midterm. Like you can, I mean, the the, the virus will will uh, circulate between borders anyway, and so yeah, I think we're we're seeing that as a like I, I don't see. I, I completely share Chris' uh, conclusion on that. I don't. I don't think. I think there will be probably a trend to uh, relocation um, and more local uh, production of uh, essential uh, goods. 
probably we will see that. That was already something that was more of a kind of a marketing trend. Uh, I think it will become more pronounced. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't I don't expect the uh, like this kind of complete border closure. I don't think it's something that is sustainable. Okay, Poulain, can I bring you in here? Because the United Nations obviously has been putting out a lot of, inf lot of I suppose, uh, I'm not quite sure what the word is, um, forecasts of disaster in the emerging markets, particularly in frontier markets. Um, that is the, is the, the move to environmentalism, greater environmentalism, and greater environmental awareness in emerging markets going to be threatened by the response to the coronavirus. After all, emerging markets are hit by the virus itself, by the, the collapse of export markets, by the collapse of remittances. Uh, and certainly those three are making life very, very difficult for at least 100 countries around the world. Excuse me, um, I agree. I think that um, the closing of borders, the difficulty of um, moving goods, services uh, between uh, borders is uh, something that is undermining um, or making it more difficult uh, for emerging markets. Um, and I think if I can touch on a point that was made earlier on about a global response um, and how, you know, that's something that um, should be, we should be doing better um, in that regard. I think that is a very, very good point. Um, you know, we have a global economy and we need to find global solutions to uh, problems that are at this scale. And I think there's a lot of lessons that need to be taken here um, from an environmental uh, and climate change uh, perspective as well. So yes, I do think that um, emerging markets are um, going to, I think, experience uh, severe challenges um, as a result of uh, this virus. And I think, you know, if there was a greater um, and more coherent response uh, at the global level, we probably could actually be addressing um, this uh, a whole lot better. And with regards to um, the question that you asked around, um, you know, where does this put um, environmental considerations? Um, I think one thing that we need to be very much aware of is that we have to also be thinking about our relationship um, and our activities and how we are uh, moving into uh, wildlife spaces. And so these, all these issues are very much interconnected with one another. And so you have to be paying attention to um, the environment and our, you know, how we, um, our relationship with the environment in even thinking about, um, you know, uh, climate and the environment. Um, yeah. I'm sure that's normatively true, but descriptively, I, you take a take a look at somebody like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. He has he sees a clear priority to get people back to work, regardless of the impact on the environment, regardless actually on the impact on the death rate. And I think Modi is learning the same lesson in India. I mean, isn't there a, isn't there a danger that something that used to be seen as kind of fundamental starts to be seen as nice to have, not need to have. In, in an environment where uh, resources are stretched, as they will be over the next 20 years, in, in emerging markets, it has a lower priority, the environment has a lower priority. Isn't that a danger, Stan? I mean, you must look at this in, in the, uh, the, your investment initiative. Yeah, I mean, I, so, so I think for sure, uh, my my um, my uh, takeaway from that. I mean, if you look at the actual genesis of the of the pandemics, uh, it's also related to um, like actually improper uh, application of environmental regulation. Uh, if if it's actually come from the virus, come from uh, wildlife uh, uh, animals, uh, so. The, the, I think there's boomerang effect with that, and there will also be an acknowledgement of this. So whether, if, like for sure, um, environmental regulation will be sacrificed in a few countries, uh, in probably in a number of countries uh, for um, economic priorities on the short term. I think this will also bring some awareness on the boomerang effect of like the, the I remember this sentence from uh, Richard Feynman, uh, was the scientist uh, reviewing the uh, 
the accident with the space shuttle in uh, like in the US, and he said like the conclusion of his speech on that was like nature cannot be fooled. So I think that's that's pretty much the conclusion we have here as well, uh, and that will also be I think the conclusion people will have with the um, with all the kind of uh, slogans that have been uh, uh, put in the media by governments on like. Uh, whether the pandemics were under control with the masks, with the uh, ventilator and this type of thing. So I, I think there will be after the crisis a greater awareness also on the idea that nature cannot be fooled. And at the end of the day, if you don't deal with those risks, you will have a boomerang effect sooner or later. So yeah, I'm hopeful on that, but I think it will be on more on the mid long term than the, the short term reaction, which will obviously be to roll back some. Number the of final population. word, Chris, is with you. Tell, I mean, is that your view of, of what's going to happen? I mean, nature cannot be fooled. And it's a nice phrase. Well, nature cannot be fooled, but I mean, the problem is that we can, we certainly believe we can fool it for a long time. <clears throat> I think it, the, the two cases that you mention are interesting because in the case of Bolsonaro, what's happening in the Amazon Basin is deeply worrying uh, and there needs to be a sort of global response to gradually uh, increase the pressure on his government to make sure that global uh, interests are taken into account because if there is dieback in the Amazon Basin, you know, our chances of staying anywhere near our uh, climate goals are, are negligible. In the case of Modi, what's quite interesting in India is that he's pushing very hard on um, on renewables and particularly um, uh, solar, and that's new, and that's really coming about because um, the costs of renewables have been falling uh, so sharply. And he, as a good Indian nationalist, sees it as uh, part of the national response that they have to actually get with uh, what is in the in the national interest. So, I mean, there are going to be different responses in different places, but I'm much more optimistic today about the emerging markets response precisely because the cost of renewables has fallen so rapidly, people just don't want to build uh, coal-fired power stations. A lot of the coal-fired power stations that are still being built in China, for example, are running at much below full capacity, uh, and the renewable side is picking up very, very fast. So I think that you're, you're increasingly seeing that there is a development path uh, to prosperity through the green economy and more and more emerging market policymakers are seeing that and that makes me optimistic. A global path to prosperity through the coronavirus that is one of the most optimistic things I've heard. I think I said through the green economy. <laughs> <laughs> through the green economy through the coronavirus that's optimism. Can I thank Chris, can I thank Puleng and can I thank Stan uh, and can I thank all of you for watching. Many many thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.